Some say it put Seattle on the map. It took unbelievable planning and preparation. It was well organized, well run, and well attended. It took a community coming together to produce an event that would in the end have 10 million visitors over the course of six months and catapult Seattle to major city status. The Seattle World's Fair, called the Century 21 Exposition, opened with fanfare on April 21st, 1962. President Kennedy got things rolling from afar. He pressed a telegraph key while on holiday in Florida to kick off the fair. Seattle was ahead of its time with this fair, apparently, utilizing the now popular remote working model. Shortly after, guest conductor, the famous Russian Igor Stravinsky, raised his baton in front of the Seattle Symphony, featuring pianist Van Cliburn as soloist. The grand event was underway. The Century 21 Exposition was originally planned to honor the 50th anniversary of the 1909 Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition, but they ran out of time. So instead, buoyed by both the space race and Boeing having bolstered Seattle's economy and image, the theme of the fair had a the U.S. is not behind the Soviet Union feel to it. Space, science, and the future were front and center showcasing America's great scientific developments of the day. The fair began, as most things do, as just an idea. Seattle City Councilman Al Rochester had been to the World's Fair in 1909. He was just 14. He soaked in the magic and wonder of it all. Those memories stuck with him. And now, as a leader in Seattle, he wanted his hometown to host such an event. After drumming up interest and securing the necessary support and funding, a World's Fair Commission was formed. From there, Rochester's big idea began to take shape. Did you know that one of the most recognizable landmarks in the world began as a napkin sketch in a German restaurant? It's true. When Eddie Carlson, part of the fair commission, dined in a Stuttgart restaurant on the top of a TV tower, he was inspired. The view was spectacular, and the concept was genius. He brought his idea to the commission, and an architect produced a tripod structure with a disc at the top. Construction on the Space Needle began just one year before the fair opened. And get this, the underground foundation was poured into a hole 30 feet deep by 120 feet across. It took 467 cement trucks an entire day to fill the hole, making it the largest continuous concrete pour ever attempted in the West. The foundation weighs as much as the Space Needle itself. A little closer to the ground, other buildings went up on the fairgrounds a coliseum, a performing center, and a science pavilion, now known as the Pacific Science Center. Since the fairgrounds were more than a mile from downtown Seattle, more transportation was needed to accommodate the throngs of people that would descend upon the city for six months. To solve this problem, they created the monorail, a modern train that ran on a single elevated rail. It was fun, it was futuristic, and it fit in perfectly with the fair's theme. The grounds were divided into different worlds. Among them were the world of science, complete with a NASA exhibit featuring satellite mock-ups and the Project Mercury time capsule. The world of Century 21, otherwise known as the world of tomorrow, featured future modes of transportation of especially keen interest was the monorail, of course. There was also an office of the future, climate-controlled farm factories, and a school of the future that had an electronic storehouse of knowledge. Their dreams about the world of tomorrow were pretty spot on. Fairgoers also got to ride in the Bubbleator, 
a translucent acrylic circular elevator that transported guests to another exhibit. It was an unexpected hit. The world of commerce and industry highlighted furniture, fashion, and the Ford Seattleite, a car of the future. All of this was beside a perfumed pool in an electric-powered pavilion with a 40-foot-high fountain created to look like a hydroelectric dam. Seattle worked hard to have a strong showcase of refined art and music, as displayed in the world of art. They boasted 72 masterpieces, from the likes of Rembrandt, Monet, and Picasso, among others. The world of entertainment had a $15 million performing arts budget. They even hired Harold Shaw, a New York City agent and manager, to take the reins. He traveled to 43 different countries, scouting out suitable talent, much to the chagrin of some of the commission who wanted to feature local talent. Shaw, never one to mince words, told them, this is supposed to be a world's fair, not a county fair. Grow up. <laughs> they secured acts to entertain the young and the old and made sure every performance venue was full of talent and crowds. The brand new Opera House showcased talent from around the world. Dancers, choirs, pop stars, Broadway stars, orchestras, bands, and comedians. The fair also had areas for shopping, an amusement park, and food. Speaking of food, the Seattle Fair introduced Belgium waffles to the American public. They'd previously made their debut at a World's Fair in Brussels in 1958. Walter Clayman opened two waffle stands at the Seattle Fair, much to the delight of fairgoers, who loved the larger baked breakfast treat. Other favorites could be found in the new 12,000-seat stadium. Acts like It's the Water Ski Show, featuring a 20-member Wisconsin water ski team, and the Canadian Military Tattoo, which was a two-hour military pageant with over 600 Royal Canadian Police. Army, Navy, and Air Force personnel. Elvis showed up too. He was filming the movie It Happened at the World's Fair, much to the delight of the throngs of teenage girls. During his time there, Elvis presented Washington Governor Albert Rosalini with a ham, which he said was from his farm in Tennessee. Actually, though, the ham had just been purchased from a local A&P. Supposedly Elvis or his people made a promise to the governor or his people that Elvis would bring them a ham from his farm. Just before the meeting, it was discovered that there was no ham to give. So the Elvis camp sent a young assistant to the supermarket to purchase a huge ham. The World's Fair celebrates and displays the best that humans have to offer. Creativity, ingenuity, innovation, discovery, and just plain fun. It did so for Seattle in 1962. It helped to cement their identity, quite literally, with the Space Needle, but even more so with their strong spirit. Thanks for watching Memory Mountain. If you enjoyed this video, please click to subscribe to our channel and hit that thumbs up button. Be sure to tap the notification bell so you'll be one of the first to know when we post our next story looking back over the landscape of Americana.